So you, you're spending 17 hours a day in the kitchen. That's, that's all you know. That's all you want to know. And uh, now you have to undergo the chemotherapy and all the different regimens in order to, to hopefully beat this cancer that's trying to take your life. How does your life change at that point? You're no longer at the restaurant. Your day is spent at the hospital? No, that's not really true. Um, so what I would do is I would go, I would drive down to UOC, uh, I think it was three days a week. Different parts. Yeah. For the initial part of chemo, I think it was three days a week. But I was probably down there four, sometimes five days a week with various other things that were going on. Um, and then I would drive back to work and work. Um, when it got to the end of treatment where they brought in the radiation, then I would go down there, get my first radiation early, like say, I think it was 8.39 in the morning, come back to Alinea, get there by 10.30, 11, work until 3 or 4, because there has to be like a 6 or 8 hour span between the, the radiation treatments that you can have in one day. So then I would drive back down, get the second round, go back to work. Now if you heard somebody else tell you that's what they did, would you think they were crazy? What are you doing? You know? Probably. <laughs> what did you think, Nick, when he was doing this? Yeah, I mean, at one point I tried to dissuade him of it and said, eat better, exercise more. And his doctors, to their credit, said, no. Like, let him do what, he's, what he wants to do. You know, I think that th they had the very good sense to know that, like what he was saying, people do what they want to be doing. You know, the worst thing to do is to go home and sit on a couch and watch TV. So um, the only part at which I like, literally wanted to drag him out of there is three days after he had his, his lymph nodes taken out and he literally had a he couldn't talk and he was back. And I was kind of like Casey Skeletor at home. You know? <laughs> like, you, know, you, can't, you can't be standing at the pass and right. with a right. brain hanging out there. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. and, uh, I said, welcome hey, home. What so about I said, the first place. Yeah, 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 you got cancer. You're freaking people out. Right. I, said, I said, welcome home. And then now go sleep for a while. And, and then they called me, um, the other chefs called me and they said, he's still here. <laughs> but, you know, like, you know, hours later. So right. I, I drove back down and I said, he's Highs are high, the lows are loaded. Did it ever, did you ever have a day where you, uh, you said, it's, it's going to get me? It's going to get me? Or was it every day like there's no way it can get me? No, it wasn't every day. There was a couple of days where you're just like, oh man. Especially right after, you know, the treatment, you're just, you, it, it just beats you down to such a, a level that you, you know, literally not being able to taste or not even being able to, like, I couldn't take a drink of that water and hold it down. Was that your ultimate frustration? It was, it was your passion. Yeah, I mean, the fact that, I think it was probably more frustrating, because when you're going through it, the treatment, that is, you, you trust the, the, the doctors that there's a good chance that you're going to be better at the end of this. But at the same time, you, you're in your head, you're going, man, if I go through all this stuff and this thing comes back, that won't be really worth it, you know? And so you kind of trudge your way through it. And about three months after everything was done treatment-wise and I could taste absolutely nothing, I think that was probably like the little point because now you're faced with all of these issues and you're going, damn, I can't taste, and how am I supposed to do this? And I had to rely on people at the restaurant. And it, it was tough, it was tough. How about when the taste came back? That was, that was pretty remarkable. It came back in, in waves of, um, well, first it was sweet. So I remember waking up in the morning and, and I was still incredibly light at the time. I was probably 130 some pounds and they were pushing me to get calories in my body. So I never put sugar in my coffee, but I grabbed a big thing of coffee at Alinea and took a couple of big spoonfuls of sugar and took a swig. And I was like, oh, that tastes sweet. And that was like the first time. And then I remember like three months later, and then I got frustrated again because you go through three or four months where all I could taste was sugar. And yeah, that would suck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. were going down, but then at the point it was just like, all right, this is getting kind of boring. And then the same thing happened where I would wake up, go to work, grab a deli of coffee, throw my sugar in it, take a swig and beat. And one morning I was just like, this coffee is terrible, it's so bitter. And then bang, it was back.
back. And then it just kept coming back like that. So. And now uh, your prognosis? They tell me I'm good, so I'm going to believe it. Yeah. Yeah. grandmother and your parents restaurant did you ever imagine that you would like be the top of the um like top of the restaurant line and like top of the culinary world I don't think specifically because I didn't even know what that meant at the time because I was 12 to 17 years old so I didn't even know that this world existed but I think what what was present then was a very strong competitive spirit so they kind of go hand in hand, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, yes, right here. Um, Grant, I was just wondering what role your family has played in this whole journey. You talked a lot about growing up, but I'm just curious now how um, they fit into the other five or six hours you have left in your day. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that part's always tough. Um, and it's something that you, you know, every person's going to kind of navigate and, and figure out on their own. I think now, well, first of all, they're all down here, which is nice. Um, but yeah, home life is tough. I mean, basically the restaurants close Monday and Tuesday, but you never really can 100% shut it off. You'll get the email, you'll get the phone call, you'll get the question from here or there. Now with the opening of Next and Aviary, you know, we're, we're getting pulled in that direction. So. It's just really important to, to try to spread yourself in the right direction that you feel is appropriate for not only you, but for them, you know, it's difficult. It's one of the hardest parts of, of doing this. It's not the actual cooking. That part is not that difficult. It's everything around that that makes it a little bit more challenging. This gentleman right here, I saw his hand go up. Is there any cuisine that would be uh, from the past that would be too esoteric? Like, could next do a menu from like ancient Rome or something? I think it could. Yeah, I think that's right, right down that <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about a lot of wacky, yeah, a lot of wacky stuff, and it, it becomes you're only having to do it for three months. That's the thing. Like, you never build a restaurant around ancient Rome. Maybe I don't. You know, maybe someone would. Um, Vegas, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> The whole Caesar's Palace. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, but, uh, you know, I think I'm eating there. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah. So, but yeah, you know, I think I think because we're doing it for three months, and if if it turns out that we have a sort of a willing audience that is willing to take some risks with us, that's the best part about that restaurant is that you can take some risks that honestly may not work out. Like that failure is a little bit of an option 
and you can you can take some risks that um, you know just may prove not as great. And not that's not a bad thing necessarily. Right. In the back, maybe somebody in the back that has I see one up there. Standing there in the back. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, I think um cooking and cancer probably is similar to anything. So you know, the kids are out there as well. I wanted to ask you how um the cancer and the cooking more so the cancer and the fact that food becomes parent. Yeah, I think that the boys were were so young. Diagnosed, I think at the time, well, they're nine and seven now, so it was what, three, four years ago, three years ago. So I had to sit down with them on the couch and try to explain them, explain to them that, you know, dad's sick, this is a problem, here, pull my hair out, that sort of thing. <laughs> I think now, you know, we're still in that position where we have to. Um, You, you have to uphold your identity as a person before you can become a good parent, I feel. And so for me, showing them the way that I'm living my life now, hopefully, inherently, will instill in them the same things that my parents instilled in me in terms of individuality, hard work, um, and passion. And I think that, for me, that's the most important thing that I can possibly teach them. And I think we do that a lot of different ways at our house, you know, whether it be spending valuable time with them away from food in general, um, traveling with them. And then literally on Monday and Tuesday when the Alinea Kitchen's shut down, we'll go in there and make Pad Thai from scratch with them and talk about it. Where's Thailand? How, why is, Dad, why are you putting fish, liquid fish that's coming out of a bottle into these noodles? You know, stuff like that. So I think that... Liquid fish. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, just kidding. <laughs> so, right. you know, these are, these are the things that, that I'm trying to do with them to help them. But I honestly, I don't think that any of that has to do with cancer. And I think that's one thing that, that we didn't touch on that is a really common question for me is, how did the cancer change you? Almost impossible to answer. But I think that the thing for me was... I don't want to let it change me at all. And that's why I only missed 14 days of service during treatment. And that's why I you know, persistently go to work. So I think that there's that element that's also very important in being a parent and sharing that with them. 